Okay, so in this next lecture, we, we will move on to do more interesting things. So, so far we've been doing this boring task of fitting a line to points, and we've looked at two views of fitting the line. The loss view, which is you minimize a loss, and the probabilistic view, which is exactly the same thing, but where we maximize probability. So we maximize the likelihood of the data for model parameters, and that's the same as minimizing the differences in relative entropies um, between the two, or minimizing the, the, the information of the data produced, the, the, the difference between the, uh, the information produced in terms of information of the data produced by the model and the data that comes from the world. Um, so now what I want to do is move on to talk about one problem that was pointed out in the previous class, which is what happens when you have very vertical points. And in fact, this is going to become even more interesting when we have um, not lines, but we have arbitrary nonlinear functions. Because um, then we'll see that maximum likelihood is actually flawed um, in, in itself. And we'll introduce the concept of regularization as a way of fixing the flaw. And regularization by itself is also poorly posed. Um, it's an ill-posed problem. When you combine all these, you get a reasonable answer. And, um, um, and, and I'll get into more details uh, about it and what I mean by ill-posedness. Um, we're going to look at polynomial regression. We're not just doing a line, but we do quadratics and third-order polynomials and so on. So we start looking at more interesting data. And in fact, I will introduce the concept of basis function. And just to sort of set up the scene here, a neuron in our artificial models of what we call neural networks is nothing but a basis function. And when we're constructing these models of images and so on, what we're doing is we're using compositional basis functions, compositional representations of these simple basis functions. And you should think of a basis function as a brick. Um, if you know how to build a brick, concrete build brick, um, and you have some glue that sticks bricks together, you can build everything. You can build the city of London, you can, well, maybe not with this charm, because it has all sorts of different kinds of bricks and so on, uh, perhaps even not brick. Um, but you can build a lot of things. So you have that basic thing, basic piece, and that piece you will be able, like a, I guess a better analogy is a, a Lego piece, and you imagine that you can stretch this Lego piece um, stretch its width or its height uh, or its depth. And so if you have all these degrees of freedom in a brick, you can then start building all sorts of structures. This is how we construct neural networks uh, with these basis functions. Um, when you do that, we will find that this gets us into trouble because we, we can build arbitrary complex functions. That means that we could find an explanation for anything, but that explanation could be wrong. And so the essential thing now is now will become one of when is our model right? We've built the structure, it's telling us this is the answer, but is that the answer? How do we test that we're getting the right answer? And that takes us into cross-validation. And. Um, uh, related to this is the concept of generalization. If the model does well in this data that I've encountered so far, how will it do on the data that I, I will encounter tomorrow? So basically, I, I measure all the stock values up to today. I fit this beautiful polynomial with the technique I learned in today's class using torch. Um, and then I use it to predict the stock prices tomorrow. How do you know that your prediction is sensible? I don't advise you to do that, by the way. <laughs> Just in case. Um, so, one of the problems that was pointed out is vertical distances are problematic. Um, and, in fact, if you have vertical distances, another way to think about this is um, when we compute the, the least squares estimate, which is the same as the maximum likelihood estimate, we end up with this issue. We have to invert this matrix. That computation is non trivial because if you have, um, so remember the, the matrix X is n by d, 
And so this whole matrix here is D by D. And I think in your homework exercise I gave you a way in which you could do some linear algebra and you could rewrite this in terms of a matrix that's N by N. Because sometimes you have N equal two patients with D equal 20,000 genes, and so it's much easier to invert a two by two than a 20,000 by 20,000 matrix. It's a very useful trick, by the way. Um, coming back to this, um, even if D is the lowest um, dimension, inverting this D by D matrix is sometimes problematic because um, quite often this matrix for real data will have very low eigenvalues, or eigenvalues are zero, and so this bombs out. Your code crashes. Um, and so one of the solutions that folks came up with was to add... Um, the proper way to do this is use it. one of the proper ways to do to deal with this is to replace X by the SVD as you did in your homework, and then to truncate it only up to the way the rank of the matrix, and then you use the SVD to invert. That's one way to do it, and packages will automatically do this for you behind the scenes sometimes. But it's important that you're aware of this. Um, another way that uh, folks figure out around this is let's just add a diagonal. So this is the identity matrix here. So the matrix that has ones in the diagonal. So in 2D would be like that. And so I multiply each element of the diagonal by this, uh, var uh, this variable delta. And I've squared it to emphasize that it's positive, to keep it positive. So I add a positive number to the diagonal and that solved the problem. And then folks figure out, oh wait, we're getting better answers. For if we, if we pay attention to how we set delta, uh, we actually get better answers. Not only have we fixed the computational problem, but actually the statistical problem is now better behaved. Um, and this was like in the 70s, this was like a mystery. Um, and so a lot of statisticians studied this, and this actually led to several papers and things called the Stein effect and so on. But we're not going to go into that. But we'll, we're going to analyze why it could be better. So the first thing is we can reverse engineer this, and I will claim that this is the loss function. That what we did is we took the quadratic loss and we added to it a penalty. Okay? So now. This is telling us fit the line. This, um, and for the line, by the way, we, um, I didn't make that in detail here because I wanted to keep the notation simple. But typically, we will not penalize the height of the line. We will only penalize the thetas that correspond to the slope. So I will only put the thetas that, so I, I don't penalize. This vector here usually wouldn't involve the first theta. But even if you threw in the first beat, that probably in practice would be okay. One of the things we often do as well is when we get data, the first thing we do is we uh, subtract the mean of the data. So we shift the points all to have zero mean. And then you can apply this to all the thetas because there's no longer a mean to learn. You have to be a bit careful when you do that. But that's, uh, that's one way of doing this. We call that process white. Um, now, what this is saying is, don't go for lines that are vertical, right? Because it's saying, keep the slope small, keep theta small. If theta is large, you pay a large cost. So keep the theta not vertical, because as, we, as was pointed out earlier, that can be problematic, because then your likelihood is, um, um, well, then you minimize the loss. You, you, in fact, you get a likelihood of infinity. The probability collapses. And uh, having infinity likelihood is not a good thing. And so maximum likelihood is poorly posed sometimes because it leads to these solutions that are catastrophic. Um, to verify that, I'm not going to go over the math. I'm going to skip the math because it's, um, it's sort of tedious. Uh, to go over in the classroom. You can watch the video, you, you'll have the slides, you can verify the math in your own time. But we do just like what we did last week. We differentiate with respect to theta, we equate to zero, and that's how we get, uh, how we go from the loss to the solution. So it's just like these squares, except now you're going to have this extra term. Um, more interestingly is to get a good geometric interpretation for what we're doing here. 
So one way to think of this loss is to think of um, I'm going to use colors is to think of there is this penalty which is a ball, we described it last week the quadratic loss is a ball and it's essentially if you cut it at uh, equal height points you get these level curves which are uh, ellipses, ellipsoids so you, uh, as you go down and that's what we're trying to minimize and so one way to do this is to formulate it as make the loss small and make uh, this term that we call the regularizer small and another way of rewriting an optimization problem is I will say minimize that and keep this below some function of delta t is an arbitrary function, I don't know what it is but there exists some function for which if I were to keep the product of theta times theta small that these two problems in optimization are equivalent so this is, um, on the left is what optimization people call Lagrangian form, on the right is a constrained optimization, and if you do a course in optimization, uh, constrained optimization, then it's very easy to actually prove the equivalence between these two. Uh, I will just um, provide this intuitive explanation for it um, to avoid getting too much into the math. But I do uh, advise you to... Optimization is one of those core things of our approach to machine learning. Finding thetas, we will always find them by, by optimizing. So knowing, uh, optimize, having a good grasp of optimization is um, something that I really recommend um, you do. And there's a lot of good tutorials on the web. Okay, let's come back to this. And let's think of an example where theta has two components. Okay, so theta 1 and theta 2. And so I'm going to draw the contour plots. So if we were cutting the ball, there's going to be theta 1, this is going to be theta 2. So this is like a top view on, on, on these balls that we're trying to minimize. Um, and I can plot... Um, and so let's look at this function here, um, theta transpose theta first. Um, in this case, this is equal to the vector... Actually, let me define this to be like this. So this vector theta 1, theta 2 times theta 1, theta 2. And you can rewrite this as theta 1 squared plus theta 2 squared. That's the dot product. Okay. And now, if I want... Um, that's a ball. And if I want... If I equate... In order to get the height of the ball, the constant level um, curves, um, I will equate this to a constant, an arbitrary constant. Now, if I have that equation, what's that the equation of? A circle. Okay, so we're going to draw a circle. Where is that circle centered at? At zero, at the origin. So that corresponds to the blue curve. Uh, for a constant, I draw it, and it's a circle center at the origin. I can pick another constant, and I draw it again. And I can pick another constant, and I draw it again. And so on. You get the picture. Imagine that it's a circle. <laughs> and... I'm going to do it for the blue, I'm not going to do it for the red, but it's the same thing. If you substitute y, uh, some y uh, variables there and theta 1, theta 2, you convince yourself that these are ellipses. Okay. The center of these ellipses is what we call the maximum likelihood estimate. Okay, because that's how we found maximum likelihood. We minimized the function of theta and found the center of the ball, and that was the maximum likelihood. Now, if we vary delta, my claim is that what we're going to get is 
the, we get a range of solutions for different values of delta. To get the solution, delta has to be equal to zero, right? Because if you make delta equal to zero, you're just basically getting rid of this term, the blue term, and you back back to maximum likelihood. If delta goes to infinity, if it becomes very large, then the only way you can minimize this loss is by making theta zero. Okay, so this over here is what happens as delta squared goes to infinity. So then as you vary delta, you get points in this curve. So all your solutions will be solutions along this curve. And it will be precisely at the point at which the two intersect. And, and you can do some reasoning about this. If you were to move along this curve, suppose you move along this curve here, your likelihood hasn't changed because you're at a constant height curve, but you've moved outside the blue circle, so you've, your blue has increased, so you're doing worse. Um, likewise, if you move to the other direction, the same thing is happening. Your likelihood hasn't changed, but your blue thing has gone up, so the optimal thing then is to be at that point at which they intersect. And you could do the same argument by following the contours of the blue curve. And so at the points of intersection, those will be your solutions, and there's infinite solutions, okay, because that's a perfectly continuous curve. So the question is, what's the optimal delta? Okay, and we'll try to answer that question. We'll come up with a method that answers that question in this class. But what's the optimal date, uh, delta for a particular data set? Okay. Um, a nice thing about this is if you have a model where you have, so keep in mind that what we have is many x's perhaps uh, D of them, where D could be, say, 20,000 um, gene um, um, expressions, and you're multiplying, so the neural model that we had for linear regression was something like this, where you have this linear neuron that essentially uh, sums each input multiplied by a parameter, Okay, so x1 times theta1 plus x2 times theta2 is how you compute the linear prediction. That's essentially what this neuron does. It just takes each input, multiplies it by what people loosely call the synaptic weight theta, and then you add it all, all up, and that's the output. Um, now, the nice thing about this estimator is that this curve, note that it if you look at this curve, it, theta 2 becomes 0 much quicker than theta 1. So a nice thing about this is that sometimes some of these variables for particular choices of delta, a lot of these variables go to 0. So in other words, you're able to automatically screen out the x's that are irrelevant to your prediction. And you only keep the relevant ones. So it's a way of, of finding which are the genes that actually are responsible, are correlated with a particular prediction. Not the genes that cause, causality and prediction, not the same thing. These are the things that are correlated uh, with the output. And that's very useful. You might want to see what genes are correlated with a particular uh, uh, you know, phenotype. And then you can do some experiment where you try to find some causal link by actually looking at those genes. Um, and so um, here is an example that comes from the book of Hasty Tuchan and Friedman, which is available for free on the web, uh, called The Elements of Statistical Learning. Um, ignore the green curve for now. Um, on the left is essentially what happens when you look at uh, a data set where you're doing linear regression, just like we did. Um, and this is for uh, prostate cancer. Um, and I forget what you're trying to predict. Uh, I apologize, it's, I, I forgot what, it, what the predictor... What, but it says you take several measurements of a patient like age and, and different you know, variables that have some medical meaning and you try to predict something else that is helpful to do diagnosis. Um, and then as you vary delta um, in this curve, 
um, then you can see that by increasing uh, here you get, have delta going to infinity um, you start at delta squared equals zero and as you increase delta the theta shrink to zero and some shrink at a faster rate than others and when you use the data you find some optimal uh, set of the deltas um, in that book what you'll also find is something called the lasso I'm not going to cover it um, in the course because um, that requires introducing a little bit more mathematics, subgradients sub and so on, because these guys are non-differentiable at these uh, corners. Um, um, but it's a simple concept. I, I do have lectures online for this, so you can find it online. So the basic idea of the lasso is instead of using theta transpose theta, which is also known as the L2 normal theta squared, we will instead <coughs> For this, we will use the L1 norm of theta, and that's the sum of absolute values. So if theta is two-dimensional, that would be theta 1. So wait, let me write it like this, or sum of absolute values of theta i. And for the two-dimensional case, you would get theta 1 minus, uh, sorry, plus theta 2. And so you have two absolute values, so you have to consider the cases plus, 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 minus, minus, plus, and minus, minus. Each of those four cases gives you one of these lines. And so when that happens, the intersection points happen at corners. And at the corner, theta 2 is exactly zero. So the lasso is a much more aggressive regularizer because it actually zeroes out the variable. It, it, it's not nearly zero, but it really zeroes out, and you actually figure out which variables are responsible. Um, time permitting, we will um, bring in some of these regularizers into the course, but be aware that um, I think Torch has these. Um, L1 regularizers are very nice. When you want to find which are the variables that should be on, you just use an L1 regularizer. It's a much more aggressive method. And then the only thing why I'm not doing the derivatives of this is because when you do the, der it's, it's in the textbook, if you do the derivatives, um, you need to worry about how do you differentiate an absolute value and how do you define the derivative at the, at the cusp. And so we use a concept called subdifferential, which is basically a set of derivatives, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to go into that. It's in the textbook. Um, but remember the intuition. You're intersecting two sets of contours. In this case, because you have these spikes, you will hit the corner with high probability, so you get very sparse solutions. And this is very much related to, if you do engineering, to the concept of something that folks use um, called compressed sensing. Trying to sort of do with just a few, the signals are sparse, just a few sets of measurements allow you to reconstruct uh, the signal in its uh, absolute splendor. Okay, let's move on from lines and move on to arbitrary functions, polynomials. Um, and we'll stu still do exactly what we did before, linear regression. We'll only do a following trick. Let's look at the curve first. So we still have x, we still have y. So the idea is still, for the, we have some data, and your data is x, y, and you observe, I don't know, 2.21, uh, maybe 6.3 and you observe 2.6 and so on. So we have a table of data and we try to fit uh, a curve to it but now we have reason to believe that a quadratic will be a better fit than, um, than a line. If you do that, what you do is you take each x, each individual x, i, i is an index over, uh, over the axis and for each of these points x i, we feed we are we feed them through a quadratic function, and then we create this vector that I'm calling phi. Sorry. Um, and phi just appends these x i's. One because we always need to shift things up and down. X i itself and x i squared. Okay. And now I need three parameters for this, um, for this 1D model. I need a coefficient for 1, a coefficient for xi, theta 1, 
and a coefficient for um, xi squared, which is theta 2. And I can learn those two. Now, assume that my true model was did not have a quadratic term. Um, so, what kind of regularizer would I use to discover that? Pardon? DL1. DL1, right? If I just um, put an L1 regularizer, it will automatically make theta to go to zero and I fit the line. So if I don't, if I, if I think, if I want to give myself freedom, I will construct a model that has a large complexity and then I will use regularizers to automatically bring the complexity down to fit the data nicely. And that's one of the intuitions of how we design models. Uh, create very complex models and then think carefully about the regularizers and introduce techniques that allow us to estimate the exact complexity. Um, so once you do this, you form this vector and now you can just think of this as the X matrix again. Okay, so it has D columns, in this case three. It will have three columns and it will have N rows where N is the number of data points. And then it's just linear regression again. So nothing, so we play the same game as before. Um, and then we could do this in 2D. Um, we could start including cross terms, x1, x2, or just keep the quadratic terms. Depends on how many degrees of freedom you want your polynomial to have. The price to pay here is if you have a very arbitrary function, the, all the possible polynomials that you have um, are combinatorial objects. You would have, you essentially have, out, you have a tensor product. You'd have x1 cube as you go to power 3, and then you have x1 squared with x, and so on. So that exponential number, so the number of terms grows up exponentially and you get yourself into trouble because um, you're trying to describe a world that is finite, with finite resources, you don't want your size of the model to grow up exponentially. It's not going to fit in your head if, if it grows exponentially. So that's a problem with polynomials. Um, but proceeding where we just fit uh, the polynomials using um, linear regression, then the, the real challenge is picking the order of the polynomials. And the first thing to understand is what is the effect of the number of data on this. So let's assume that my data is produced by uh, a quadratic. So I have some, there is some process in the world. So there is the true distribution of the world, and that's a quadratic. Okay. So the universe, for this case, is behaving as a quadratic. And let's assume that I have these from the, these are the data that are coming from this quadratic function. Okay, there are these blue points. Um, so I'm going to refer to these guys as the train data. And again, the x-axis, this is a 1D problem, I have x and y. So we're just doing 1D regression, and then we're using quadratic model. Now, let's assume now that I use a model. Now, I choose a model. So the world was a quadratic that had, and I, essentially what I do is I draw uh, random variables according to that Gaussian distribution, just like I explained in the previous class. Sample from a uniform, do the transformation of the CDF, and then I add them to this and the, 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 uh, I, I picked this mean. And so, um, so now I'm going to choose the model to be also, and, and, and here I add this because in, in the true model I do know the values of theta naught, theta one, or theta two. So by true model is, there is a particular setting of theta naught, one and two, which is the true mechanism from which I've sampled the data. And then I have my model, which the hat, whoops, xi. And then my goal is to come up with theta naught, theta one, and theta two. So in this case, my model matches reality. Reality says that 
the process that generates the data is a quadratic polynomial. And the model says, I'm going to guess that the data comes from a quadratic. So I've guessed the model right. And if you guess the model right, then the, the samples from the model, you know, I'll, I'll plot my model. It's the same quadratic function. It has the same mean. On t uh, so I'm plotting it in, on top. And so my data from the model, um, or in fact, I'm going to call this test data. And I'm going to make a distinction here. Think of training data as the data that I have up today that I used to fit my model. And let's use test data will be the data that someone will give me and I will make predictions according to that test data. So if I make predictions according to my test data, I get that session of points in the, in the green, uh, in the red curve. And, and I find that my model fits reality. Everything is nicely. So if you know the model, um, you can fit things perfectly up to the noise level. I will always make errors. There is an error that's governed by the variance of these points. And I will always incur that error. So this error is unavoidable. That's the noise error. If you can't do better than uh, the noise because you, you can't possibly go through all the points. So you'll always be a bit uncertain. You'll always pay these spring values. The minimum amount of error. So if you're doing better than the noise, if your error is below the noise, you have a problem, like here. Here the model, um, when I use the train, so that, so this, I want to make sure that's clear. Let me repeat this again. Um, the train data is what I used to fit the model. The test data is what I used to evaluate the model. So, so what's happening here is if I have just a few points, I can fit past the model through all the points very easily. Maybe when I have three points, I can always fit the quadratic to, to go nicely through these um, um, three points. And, and then I think, oh, I have a great model. But no, you don't. You're doing better than the minimum error, but that's because you're overfitting. Um, the danger there is that when you get new data, you might find that another curve would have given you better results. Okay, but that's still not bad. I mean, both, uh, both the test error, the train error, they converge to the noise level error. So everything is nice. Um, now, what happens when my data comes from a quadratic still, but I use a model that is of the form theta naught plus xi theta 1. Okay. And by the way, the curve I forgot to say, this is with uh, i equal 1 to n, and this is as n goes uh, increases. So n is the number of data. So here, as I increase the number of data, the quadratic error, the mean square error, goes to the, uh, the right level, to the noise level. Now, if I use a line, I mean, this is very intuitive. If I, if I try to fit a line with uh, quadratic data with a line, no matter how much data I get, I will not get a good fit. Um, these days, you've probably heard of this term called big data. Who's heard of big data? <laughs> this is big data, lots of data. And trust me, I could be drawing this data, make it as big as you wish. It would never work. I would never do well. Um, big data is pointless if you have the wrong model. Um, no matter how much data is, you can drive the wrong conclusions if your hypothesis is incorrect. Um, here my hypothesis, my model, is too simple, and so both the train and the test error will be large. I c there is a bias, in a sense, that I will never be able to, do, to fit. Now, there is a case for big data, though. And, and that happens when I use a very large polynomial. So let's assume that I'm going to use theta naught plus xi theta 1 plus a bunch of more terms all the way up to xi to the, um, I think I, uh, 25. 
uh, times theta 25. Okay, so I use now a very large degree polynomial. Let's see what happens. If you have only a few points, um, let's look at this case first. If you have only a few points, and when you draw your polynomial, your polynomial has very high degree, it will do this. You will get zero training error because it can go through all the points nicely. For the test points, this is problematic because Maybe my test point, because it was a quadratic, this was my test point. And so now my errors are huge. Okay, my springs are very large. In fact, absurdly large in some cases. So my errors in the test data are very large. I did well with my training data, I fit my model, I have zero error. So I often have the students come to me and say, this model just kills it, it, goes, it gives me zero error on the data. Um, models that give zero error are very dangerous. But um, what you can do is you can keep increasing the number of data. And imagine now I have a very large training data set, hugely large. So I have now trillions of points from my training set. Now when I fit the polynomial to these points, the polynomial will have, it will still oscillate, but it will be kind of caught by these points. It's constrained by the date. It keeps being pulled back. So even though it has all these degrees of freedom. So now I have a reasonable fit. I have something that also starts behaving like a quadratic. And so as the date increases, I start getting this. So if you have very large data sets, use massive... Um, so, and this is very important in, in the context of deep learning. We try to use models for images for, for a long time. For a long time we were working in this regime. Our models were too simple. Um, but also we had too few data points. So we were kind of working in this domain. This is pretty much the 80s and 90s. This is where we were. We were underfitting. Um, what's happened recently is, um, I don't know exactly where we are in this curve, so this is one of the big mysteries, um, but we've just scaled the models to be much larger because we have the data now and we have, computer science has given us the tools to process that data and store the data, manage the data, load the data to memory, do computations across many CP, uh, CPUs and GPUs. And so now we can do this calculation. We can build really big models and we're able to do this. Um, it may be that we're, yeah, I don't know exactly where we are in this curve, but certainly we're doing much better by increasing our model complexity. So neural nets now that have billions of parameters start providing reasonable models for images and sounds and so on. And speech recognition and image recognition have never been this good. Um, so that's basically it. Um, if you later, if you make your model, if your data increases, you need to make your model large. There's another way to com control complexity, and that's, um, I'm going to wrap up with this slide here. The other way to control model complexity is um, to vary delta. Right, because you can, you have a very high degree polynomial, but you can make many of those thetas go to zero by having a particular choice of delta. And so if delta is very small, the polynomial will still tend to go over all the points. But as you increase delta, um, the, you start getting rid of the oscillations in the polynomial. So delta gives us another way of controlling complexity. So now we have two ways of controlling complexity, the number of data and delta. In the following lecture, we, we run a bit behind, so I'm going to, I think, move the lectures by one.
because I want to spend time in these concepts. And we're going to introduce yet another way of doing fitting data called kernels. And they will have yet more parameters that will control complexity. And then we'll discuss cross-validation, which is a way of computing delta when you have supervised labels. And that will solve this problem. That will tell us how to control the complexity, how to fit the models, and then the only thing that left for us to do is to do optimization, to compute theters, and then all the work, the cleverness, is coming up with good regularizers and setting up these coefficients, these deltas, to make sure that our predictions are reasonable. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um,